All right, welcome everybody. Thank you guys so much for being here today. This is our last class here for the Food as Medicine series that we've been doing. Um, I appreciate those of you who have stuck with us to the end here. This is a lot of information, and hopefully today this class will kind of bring everything together. You know, the different classes we've done up to this point have kind of zoomed in on certain aspects of diet, um, you know, certain things that we eat, certain things that we should avoid, you know, in, in our diet. And so hopefully this class will bring it all together and kind of help you with a takeaway of what do I eat? You know, because there's a lot of different options out there and it's really easy, you know, to kind of get confused with, you know, one person says this, somebody else says that. And, you know, a lot of the advice that's out there, it's partial truths. You know, there's truth to everything. But in terms of practically, how do you apply all of this information, that's really what we're going to be going through today. And so there's a lot of information we have to cover. So I'm going to do my very, very best to get through as much of this um, as we can. So, um if I'm going too fast, just let me know. But we're going to kind of just dive right in and, and um, you know, kind of go into food as medicine. So, again, I start all the classes with the food you can eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. And so, like I said, today we're going to talk about that balance of what do we eat to fuel our bodies. So I kind of want to start with this question of, you know, what has changed in our modern diet that makes us so sick, you know, because one of the things we're going to be covering throughout this class is how our diet has radically shifted, um, especially over about the past 50 to 100 years. And, um, you know, and as we can tell, we are living longer kind of, you know, as as humans, but we are not necessarily living healthier. And so what is it that has shifted in how we eat that is making us so sick? And, you know, there isn't just one thing, you know, that we're doing, but everything that we're doing wrong in our diets can be connected back to a process in the body called inflammation. And I love talking about inflammation because it's one of those terms that most people have heard of, but you kind of don't know exactly what it is or what it does in the body. Um, you know, and it's a pretty complicated system, but essentially, you know, what is making us so sick is that a lot of the foods in our diet are triggering an inflammatory response in the body. And so when we talk about what inflammation is, inflammation actually has a really important function in the body. Inflammation's job is to come in when we are injured and to break down injured tissue so that the body can come in and heal. An injury could be something as drastic as spraining your ankle or breaking a bone, um, or it could be something as, as small as exercise. You know, every time you exercise, you break down muscle tissue and the body, you know, releases a little bit of this inflammatory response, um, but then it comes in behind it and it heals stronger. So we end up stronger, you know, after we've exercised because that little bit of inflammation, you know, broke down what wasn't needed so that we could then come in and rebuild. So inflammation is actually a very, very important process, but only in small amounts. You want a bit of inflammation, uh, you know, at certain times, but you want also the ability to turn that inflammation off when it's not needed anymore. And so inflammation can be healthy when it's localized, you know, so it's in one spot. Uh, when it's visible, you know, the visible signs of inflammation are heat, swelling, redness, you know, think spraining your ankle, you know, that's an appropriate inflammatory response. But the most important thing is that that inflammatory response is acute. So it's a short lived response. Um, inflammation starts to become unhealthy when it's systemic. You know, so when you have inflammation all over your body, that can be measured in certain lab values, such as something called C-reactive protein. If anybody's ever had a CRP marker, that is a marker of systemic inflammation. Um, you know, so when, when inflammation is systemic, you have that inflammation all over your body. Sometimes it's undetectable. You know, so sometimes we don't feel the effect of that wear and tear internally on our bodies. But most importantly, inflammation is unhealthy when it's chronic. So when you have kind of inflammation brewing all the time, think about just a smoldering fire that's always there. Um, and so, in, you know, uh, people often ask, well, how do I know if I'm inflamed or not? If you've ever been diagnosed with anything that ends in itis, you have inflammation, you know, so gingivitis, 
Dermatitis, eczema, that's an inflammatory response. Gastritis, that's an inflammatory response. Um, cystitis, you know, so, I mean, you could go on and on and on. Um, but any itis condition is basically your doctor diagnosing you with inflammation at a certain place in the body, and they don't always know what triggers it. And, um, you know, a lot of the patients we actually see here at the Reardon Clinic come in with all these different multiple symptoms and you know they've seen their gastroenterologist for their 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 gastritis and you know they've seen their cardiologist for their 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 atherosclerosis and they've seen you know all these different doctors but what connects all the different symptoms they're having is inflammation inflammation that's kind of you know brewing out of control in the body and so um and so the key with inflammation is you want to have a balance like I said, you want the ability to be able to turn on inflammation when you're injured, but you also want the ability to turn it off quickly. You know, that's why when you sprain your ankle, they say ice it, elevate it, compress it. All of those things are to calm down that inflammatory response, you know, very, very quickly. And the, the, the more quickly you can calm that down, the sooner the body can start healing, the sooner you can get all those regenerative cells in there to heal whatever tissue was injured. And so unfortunately, a lot of us exist in this sort of a state where we have way more of the cells that trigger inflammation and not enough of the cells that turn it off. And because of that, we walk around with all these chronic inflammatory conditions. And so the example I always use to kind of, you know, to, to uh, delineate the difference between somebody who's balanced in their inflammation versus somebody who's not is if you had two people that went out and hiked eight miles, you know, if you have a healthy balance of inflammation versus somebody who doesn't, you know, when you hike eight miles, it's appropriate to be a little bit sore that night, you know, because you, you created a lot of wear and tear on your body. Maybe you're even sore a little bit the next day. But if you're in a, in a balanced inflammatory state, you know, by the end of that second day, your body should already be in recovery mode. You should have calmed down that inflammatory response versus somebody who's in an unhealthy inflammatory state. They have the exact same trigger. You know, they've hiked eight miles, but rather than just being, you know, sore for a short window, they're sore for an entire week after that, after they, they do that, that, that exercise. And that's because they triggered that inflammation and then it just kept brewing and brewing and brewing and it kept doing its job and breaking down and breaking down and breaking down. And so it was much harder for the body to heal. And so that, that's what a lot of our modern diet is doing to us is it's putting us in this unhealthy state of inflammation. So what does inflammation have to do with diet? You know, that's, that's kind of the, the big question. And, um, you know, to answer that, as I mentioned in the beginning, it helps to go back and look at kind of where we started. You know, when you look at the ancestral diet and then you look at how our diet has changed, you know, with the introduction of more grains, with the introduction of more processed food, with the introduction of all the additives that we talked about in the second class, you know, when you look at how the diet has changed, it becomes very clear why we are triggering more and more of this inflammation. And, you know, a lot of it, you know, a lot of the communication to our body comes from what we're eating. And so we're going to look at how the diet has shifted through all these different time periods and how that message of inflammation has been amplified, you know, kind of with, 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 each, with each revolution. Um, if you've, just as a little bit of a sidebar, there is a, a, a notebook that goes with this class. And so it has this PowerPoint in it. And it, as you'll notice on some of the slides, I have some book recommendations or movie recommendations, documentary recommendations. These are just some great resources that if you feel kind of overwhelmed with all the information, you know, this, this one in particular, this book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, I always like to point out because it's, it's a, it's kind of an oldie, but it's a really great book by Michael Pollan, and he talks a lot about these, the, the dietary shifts that have happened and how that has affected the progression of chronic disease for us. And so, but on the different slides, there are some different recommendations that if you want more information, definitely check out those resources. 
All right. So when we talk about what is it in the diet that is triggering inflammation, there are four major things we're going to talk about and four major sort of, um, you know, aspects of our diet that are most contributory to inflammation. And so the number one on this list is we're going to talk about what percent of our diet comes from a whole food source. Um, we're going to talk about number two, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. We're going to talk about number three, the glycemic index. So how much sugar is in our diet and what sort of an impact that has on us and inflammation. And then number four, we're going to talk about the ORAC score, which is essentially color. How much color do we have in our diet? And if you kind of follow the guidelines that we're going to talk about with these four things in terms of your diet, you will be doing better than probably 90% of people that live in the United States today. Because, you know, just following these kind of four guidelines, you will kind of radically reduce the amount of inflammatory triggers that are in your diet. All right, so number one, this I always tell people if, if you get nothing else out of the class or if you're falling asleep, tune in for just about, you know, three minutes here because this is probably the most important concept that nutritionally I could teach. And that is that you want to get the bulk of your diet from a whole food source, you know, and so I, I always give people kind of the guidelines, shoot for about 80% of your diet, um, you know, but eating whole foods is essentially eating foods in their original state. So the example I give here is an apple. An apple is an example of a whole food. Now, if you take that apple and you cook it and you mash it down, take off the peel, add some sugar, add some cinnamon, make applesauce, applesauce is not a bad food choice. But it's, you've taken some things away, so it's one step away from that apple as it was originally designed in nature. Now, you could take that a couple steps further and just extract the apple juice. Even if it's a fresh, pressed, you know, apple juice, you know, you're going to get some nutritional value, but you've taken away all the fiber and you've taken away, you know, a lot of the different components of the apple that were there originally, you know, in that original whole food. And so I, I encourage people, you know, if you can get 80% of your diet from a whole food source, then that's going to cover every nutritional sin that you could commit. Everything else we're going to talk about all goes back to just eating, you know, real food, just eating whole foods. And, you know, whole foods are your fruits, your vegetables, um, your, your grass-finished protein sources, nuts and seeds, you know, all of those foods that if you took them back, you know, 500 or 1,000 years ago, the people would recognize, you know, half the food, food I air quote food <laughs> that we, we eat today, most people, you know, 500 or a thousand years ago wouldn't even recognize, you know, because it's been processed or food's been changed or it's been altered. Um, and, and a lot of times the alteration of food, especially in the, in the food industry is for, you know, the company's benefit. You know, they want food to last longer on shelves. They want it to taste better so that you'll eat more of it. You know, they're, they're triggering some of those biological mechanisms we have, you know, that, that, kind of drive us to eat more. You know, a lot of patients who, who shift back to eating whole foods, eating real food, what they report is they feel like they're eating more than they've ever felt, but they're, they're more satisfied. You know, so they're going longer periods without having to eat. And they, they, they are enjoying the taste of food a lot more because, you know, all those biological mechanisms are there that are connected to eating real food, eating whole foods. And so, you know, and the other thing I always encourage in terms of whole foods is, you know, especially, you know, if, I don't know if anybody's ever seen any of those memes that, you know, say, you know, oh, I'm gluten free, dairy free, sugar free, you know, nut free, you know, and, you know, and, and then there's a picture of somebody eating, you know, a bowl of ice and they're like, you know, this is what my diet looks like, you know, and, and it's kind of, you know, funny, haha, you know, especially in this era where a lot of people are removing a lot of those foods from their diet. But if you focus on the 80%, you know, focus on what you should be getting in your diet rather than focusing on, I can't have wheat. I can't have corn. I can't have sugar. I can't have all these things, you know, focus on, you know what, look at all these vegetables I can eat. Look at how I can cook these vegetables in different ways with different oils, with different spices, you know, get really good protein sources, you know, and how, you know, if you can, you know, focus on it from that perspective, all of a sudden, it's like this whole just, you know, window of opportunity for eating really good food 
is open to you. And it's in, and it's, it's much easier to focus on that and to stick with that rather than focusing all the, on all the things you have to avoid, you know, in your diet to quote, eat, eat healthy. And so, and like I said, I always give the 80, 20 rule still gives you 20% that if you want to enjoy something, you know, that isn't a whole food, you know, I always tell people, enjoy the heck out of it. Don't feel bad about it. If you want to have dessert, you know what? Don't feel bad. Enjoy it, you know, but make it a part of your 20% and then refocus back on the 80%, you know, the next day. And, um, and just sticking with that, like I said, you will do better than most people, um, in terms of, you know, the quality of food you're eating. All right. So I always, I always have to apologize for this slide and anybody who's attended my class, I always, you know, you know, I'm a huge nerd. And so I, I, I like to share some of the, the biochemistry that goes on in my brain in terms of, you know, you know, food and in the, in, in actually how food affects us at the cellular level. And so to orient you, what you're looking at here are what are called essential fatty acids. And we get these fatty acids from eating good quality fats. You know, our body breaks down, um, breaks down these fats into what are called these essential fatty acids. We have to get them in our diet. And so the two we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids. And most people probably have heard of omega-3s. You know, we know that they're, you know, omega-3s are high in fish oil. We know they're good for our heart, for cardiovascular purposes. We know they're good for inflammation, for joint pain, you know. And so, um, you know, but not a lot of times do we talk about omega-6 fatty acids. And so primarily omega-6 fatty acids come from plant-based oils. You know, so your corn oil, your sunflower oil, safflower oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil, you know, so these oils, which, you know, a lot of these oils, you know, if you were just eating the grains and not the, the, the oil extract from these grains, you probably wouldn't be getting too many omega-3s. But what's happened in our modern world is, does anybody, do you guys recognize these oils? These are all the oils that are used when we fry foods, when we, um, if you flip over a package, almost any packaged food you eat, whether it's crackers or chips or, you know, you name it, you know, any of those, those packaged foods are going to be cooked in these oils. And the reason being is they're cheap. Corn oil is a great example. You know, corn is subsidized. So corn oil is a cheap oil, you know, to, to cook in and they're shelf stable. You know, so potato chips cooked in these oils are going to last a lot longer than, say, potato chips cooked in coconut oil. You know, those will go rancid on the shelf a lot faster. And so but when we get these omega-6 fatty acids, what happens is our body turns those um, those omega-6 fatty acids into something here called arachidonic acid. You'll see that here at the bottom. And arachidonic acid gets turned into these pro-inflammatory mediators. So these are the triggers for inflammation. You know, the more of these prostaglandins and leukotrienes you have in your body, the easier it is to trigger inflammation. You know, so remember the example I gave you of the person who hiked eight miles and was really, really sore for a week? Somebody like that is going to have a lot of these pro-inflammatory mediators floating around in their bloodstream. And so it's very easy to trigger an inflammatory response. And so, and it's much harder to turn it off, you know, the more of those you have that are triggering inflammation. Now, one thing I will mention with omega-6s is, is, you know, I have them circled, you know, on this chart here in red. Omega-6 fatty acids are not all bad. And in fact, they are essential, you know, so we need them just as much as we need the omega-3 fatty acids. But the reason I have them circled here in red is because in the standard American diet, we way over consume omega-6 fatty acids. And so we actually measure a ratio in the blood of omega-6s to omega-3s. And we actually here at the Reardon Clinic, we measure all the different breakdowns because you have linoleic acid right here, gamma linoleic acid, dihomogamma-linoleic acid, all of these omega-6s you see right here have this little side pathway that they can still turn into this anti-inflammatory prostaglandin right here, um, you know, um, and then we also measure omega-3 fatty acids and all the breakdown of the different omega-3 fatty acids. And I would say on average, you know, in, in our patient base, it's probably about 20 to 1. People have about 20 times the amount of omega-6s versus omega-3s. And a lot of that, it goes back to our diets. 
And so um, when we get a diet that's high in these omega-3 fatty acids, those get turned into anti-inflammatory mediators down here. So like I said, if we have an inflammatory balance, we have an equal ability to turn on inflammation as well as turn it off, you know, when it's not needed. And so now it's beautiful. As I said, go back to rule number one, you know, eating mostly whole foods in your diet. Most of your whole foods like nuts and seeds actually have both omega-3s and omega-6s in them. You know, and when you're eating real food, you're getting both of these in a good ratio amount. It's only when we start eating a lot of processed food or a lot of foods that are are artificially high in some of these omega-6 fatty acids that we start to get out of balance. And so now one other thing too, you know, I was, I was, I love the idea of food truly being medicine. And if you, if you missed the last class that I gave the, the class prior to this one, go back and watch that on YouTube because the whole class was, was about statistically how food is a much more powerful medicine than any drug that's out there. And so, but in terms of our biochemistry, I always like to point this out that, you know, when you take something like Advil, Advil is is an NSAID drug. Advil is also called a COX inhibitor. So when you take that Advil, that anti-inflammatory, what you're doing is you're knocking out this enzyme right here, this cyclooxygenase, this COX enzyme. You can have the same effect in your body as taking an Advil without all the negative side effects as building up these omega-3s and reducing your omega-6 fatty acids. And so, um, you know, so you really truly can have the effect in a much stronger, more intuitive sort of way, you know, as taking a medicine, you know, just by using your food and using your diet. Now, I will say this, a lot of people, because of how we eat, and because there are so many things that trigger inflammation in our world, what I found is to get this into balance, I'm having to do higher and higher amounts of fish oil supplementally with patients. And I was actually just listening to a webinar recently, um, and the doctor that was presenting was talking about an NFL player who had a spinal cord injury who was taking 18,000 milligrams of fish oil, which to give you an idea, most fish oil supplements are between 1,000 and 2,000. So he was taking 18,000 milligrams per day, but he was walking and he was exercising and he was healing and he was recovering. And so I wouldn't do that without the help of a doctor because fish oil, you know, because, you know, the, of the, the, the other pathways it affects, it can have a little bit of a blood thinning effect, which is good. You know, the older we get, you know, we, we need a little bit of that. But sometimes um, if you get too much fish oil, you can get easy bruising, nosebleeds, stuff like that. So but under the care of a doctor, you can build, you know, the, that fish oil up pretty high to get the anti-inflammatory effect that you need. Um, one other thing I will note is foods high in omega-3s, you know, so fish oil, fish is probably the best source of omega-3s that are out there. Um, anytime you do stuff like flax seeds, chia seeds, walnut, any of these kind of plant-based you know, sources that are good in omega-3s, those are all high in this up here, this alpha linoleic acid. And so I have had patients that have come in that, that do a lot of these, these seeds, but they're still low in their EPA. And what we find is that there are certain nutrients that you need to convert those, some of those plants into this EPA. So you need, if you look down here in the fine print, you need magnesium and you need zinc and you need B6. And so, um, you know, so of course fish or fish oil is one of the best sources, you know, of getting this, this EPA. But if you do some of the more plant-based omega-3s, make sure you have these levels checked to, to make sure you're able to convert, you know, that alpha linoleic acid, you know, into the, the active, active form. And the other thing too, I'll note is that they've looked at the fat of animals that are grass fed versus animals that are corn fed, you know, corn's over here, corn's real high in omega-6 fatty acids. So when you look at the, the, the composition of the fat of the animals that are grass finished, they have a much higher amount of omega-3s in their fats. And so, um, you know, so that's the importance of really, you know, not only are they healthier, you know, they're, the, the animal is less inflamed, you know, but also they transfer that, that those omega-3s, you know, onto us, you know, through, through the, through what we're eating. So quick question. Yeah. Same, like, uh, same issue with fish oil, though, that a lot of our fish now are 
Yeah, so the question was with the with the fish oil, a lot of the fish being fed with corn. Um, and, you know, a lot of the farm-raised fish are, you know, a lot of the um, fish that's used in the production, at least of good quality fish oil supplements, um, they use kind of the smaller fish like anchovies and sardines, fish lower on the food chain. And so they're, those fish are high, you know, in, in the omega-3s. And so they, the, the companies that do the quality control testing, you know, measure the amount of EPA and DHA. So what they put on the bottle is what's in there. I always tell people, though, don't ever buy your fish oil supplement at Walgreens or Walmart. You know, if, if, if it is, you know, you get what you pay for. Let's put it that way in terms of a fish oil supplement. So you definitely want to go with a reputable brand if you're going to take it supplementally, especially if you're going to take it in higher doses. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. What supplements? Yeah, so the question is what supplements, what are good? You know, probably one of the be- the best reputable companies is Nordic Naturals. And, you know, I tend to trust companies that do one thing and they do it really well. And so Nordic Naturals does a really great job with their fish oil. Um, if you're one of those people that tends to still burp it, you know, you might look at stomach acid, make sure you're able to digest it well, because it might be more, you know, the inability to digest it. The Barleans, Barleans is another good brand. Yep. Yep. Barleans is a good brand of fish oil and it tastes good. And so, what's yeah. your take on algae? Because I've heard that it's even farther down the chain of bad stuff that you can't get your hands on. And one comment is I used to work for a doctor and he said keep the fish oil pills in the freezer. Mm hmm. A little bit lower down. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, what about the algae? And I mean, in that algae can be, can be a great source. You know, again, a lot of it just depends on, you know, the, the company that, that you're using. And so in terms of, you know, uh, the quality of it. So, but fish oil is one of those, you know, where we live, you know, in Kansas, you know, where the Reardon Clinic is, you know, I find a lot of patients, unless you're really good about doing grass fed, really good about getting, um, you know, nuts and seeds with all the nutrient cofactors, you know, a lot of times a fish oil supplement is needed for most people. And so, all right. So the third thing that connects our diet with inflammation is our blood sugar, you know, and, you know, again, it all goes back to rule number one. If you are eating 80% of your diet from a whole food source, you are going to be eating a much lower glycemic diet than what most people eat. And so when we talk about blood sugar, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, a lot of people, again, blood sugar is kind of like inflammation. We've heard of it. We know what it is. But what exactly is the mechanism of what's going on? And, you know, when we, when we talk about blood sugar, when you, if I were to right now eat a big spoonful of sugar, you know, you know sugar, you know, table sugar is about, glucose, 50% fructose. So half of what I eat is immediately going to be available for energy. So that's going to go down. It's going to be absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, glucose, you know, gets transported around in the bloodstream. But to get glucose where you can use it is you need a hormone called insulin. So insulin is the hormone that grabs that sugar from the blood and puts it into our muscle cells, our brain cells, Um, our skin cells, you know, I mean, you name it, our heart muscle cells, all of our cells get access to that that blood sugar, that glucose um, via insulin. And so so when we talk about, you know, uh, blood sugar, when you run an elevated blood sugar, you know, the body's response to that is to release more insulin because it assumes if you've got a high amount of sugar in the blood, you need more insulin to pull it out. Well, what's happening is for years and years and years, starting with our kids, you know, our kids are getting a huge load of sugar just in kind of their daily, daily diet. Um, You know, if you eat something, like I said, that spoonful of sugar, what's going to happen is your blood sugar is going to very quickly go up. That's a food that is high glycemic 
is going to get that glucose into your blood very, very quickly. So your blood sugar spikes very, very quickly. And your body senses this quick increase in blood sugar, so it dumps a bunch of insulin. So you, you release this huge bolus of insulin so that the body then very quickly pulls all that sugar out. And what very often happens when we have a really high glycemic food is because we dumped so much insulin, a lot of times your blood sugar will actually dip down a little bit too low. And this is what's called hypoglycemia. Or if you know somebody who's a reactive hypoglycemic, those are the people that their blood sugar shoots up and then it tanks very, very quickly. And so I always tell people hypoglycemia, the other name for that is hangry. You know, if you've ever been, you know, so hungry that you get irritable or you get shaky and, you know, you, it's almost like you just get consumed with, you know, what am I going to eat? Your, your brain quite literally thinks you're going to starve, you know, when your blood sugar tanks like that. And so when we're eating a lot of foods that are doing this sort of a pattern to our blood sugar, especially over time, you know, that creates a huge amount of inflammation in the body. And especially too, when our insulin levels stay elevated, that creates a lot of insulin. And we talked a lot about that in the very first class. For those of you who were here, we talked about the effects that simple carbohydrates have on insulin and the effects that those have on our hormones and the effects that has on our fat storage. So if you want more detail, go back to that first class. But for our purposes today, you know, when we when we eat foods that are high glycemic, it does this sort of a roller coaster pattern to our blood sugar. And so High glycemic foods, I, I, always, I always joke, they're all the foods that taste really good. So something tastes really good and it's not a fat, usually it's high glycemic. You know, So white flour, white potatoes, white rice, white sugar, juices, fruit juices, even some fruits are high glycemic and they're gonna have this sort of an effect on your blood sugar. What you want to focus on are getting foods that are lower glycemic. You know, so foods like that are high in fiber, foods that are high in fats, and foods that are high in proteins. What's going to happen is because those foods get broken down a lot more slowly compared to the sugar, that the energy gets more slowly released into your bloodstream. So you have a steady source of energy over a long period of time. And you usually don't go into this hypoglycemic um, reaction right here. Because when we go hypoglycemic, what the body does is it releases a lot of cortisol. You know, so adrenals, I've seen it, uh, you know, adrenal pictures in people where the reason they're in adrenal fatigue is because of their blood sugar. Their blood sugar is going up and down, up and down. And so, um, and when we release more cortisol, you know, that can create, you know, that, that disrupts our body's ability to manage inflammation appropriately. So like I mentioned, high glycemic foods are all the foods that taste really good, all the white foods, um, all of these foods, um, the, the glucose rapidly enters the bloodstream. We strain the pancreas to overproduce insulin. Here's the other thing. I, like I said, I mentioned this in the first class, but if anybody is interested in losing weight, the hormone you want to monitor, the hormone you want to watch more so than calorie intake, more so than anything else, are your insulin levels. Because it is almost impossible to lose weight when insulin levels are high. Because insulin doesn't just help us, you know, pull the glucose out of our bloodstream. When insulin levels are high, what that is signaling is that the body is going to store away fat. Because, which makes sense, you know, if, you're, if you have a lot of excess calories, if you have a lot of energy and your body's releasing all this energy, it makes sense that you would want to be kind of in storage mode. And so if your insulin levels are elevated, your body is going to be storing fat and it's very, very difficult to burn fat, to lose weight. You might be able to lose some water weight, but to actually lose true fat that we store, to actually burn that what you have to do is bring those insulin levels down. And that's why if anybody's heard of the ketogenic diet, that's why keto is effective because keto, when you eat fat, you get energy, but fat does not stimulate an insulin response. So insulin levels stay low and you get energy. And so over time, what happens is people start pulling their stored fat and they start burning their stored fat. And so it all goes back. Don't, don't waste your time counting calories. You know, don't waste your time, that whole energy in, energy out model. Watch your insulin levels and, um, and watch the quality of food that you're eating. And the foods that trigger an insulin response are all of these high glycemic foods. 
low glycemic foods are foods like vegetables, um, you know, certain whole fruits, um, dairy, meats, good fats, all of those are going to keep your blood sugar much more steady and keep, you know, give you that steady source of, of energy without, you know, affecting your blood sugar drastically. And that keeps your insulin levels low. And so, as I mentioned, when you're on kind of that high glycemic up and down, you know, roller coaster, um, that can create adrenal exhaustion, poor tolerance to stress. Um, you know, we, when we're, when we, uh, you know, our blood sugar is dropping that, that makes us crave more sugar, you know? So if you've ever been in that cycle where it's like, you're trying to quit sugar and it's like, you know, you try and give it up, but then it's like, you just kind of keep coming back to it and craving it. What, what your body is craving is energy and, and you've gotten on that roller coaster and to get yourself off of it, you've got to retrain your body to burn fat. And to do that, you got to bring insulin down. Now, another interesting connection is high insulin. You know, so when our insulin levels are high, that activates an enzyme called delta-5 desaturase, which I'm going to sneak back here for a second. Delta-5 desaturase is right here. So the higher our insulin levels are, the more we're going to be converting this, this DGLA into arachidonic acid, which is inflammatory, versus this one right here, which is anti-inflammatory. So the higher your sugar levels are, the more you're going to be promoting um, inflammation in the body. All right. And so, and then the last thing too, is the more we choose high glycemic foods, the less we choose whole foods, you know, because most of your high glycemic foods um, are refined foods. They're not whole foods. And so the more you can choose a low glycemic diet, naturally you're going to choose better quality foods that have more nu- more nutritional value for you. All right, so the last thing here, the last connection between our diet and inflammation is looking at color. And this is, this, I love talking about color because this is something that's very easy to grab onto. You know, visually, when you look at your meal at night, you should see five different colors on your plate, you know, and the more variety of colors you have, the more nutritional value you have in that meal. You know, so a meal that is salmon with, you know, roasted broccoli and sautéed greens and a sweet potato um, has more color in it than, say, um, a piece of white chicken with white rice and a a white roll, you know, with um, maybe white potatoes. You know, so the difference in terms of nutritional value is in the color. And the color in foods provides what are called phytonutrients. And these phytonutrients actually calm down inflammation. They calm down a process in the body called oxidative stress. So the more color um, you can get, the better. And I always tell people, you know, if you're preparing your meals, the foods that, that stain your fingers or that stain the cutting board, those are the best foods to be eating. So beets and greens and um, you know, even sweet potatoes and carrots, you know, you you should have a colors on your fingers, you know, after you've been chopping all those vegetables and that's a good sign of, of really, really high nutrient density. Yes. Question. So the question is what about tomatoes and, um, tomatoes are a really fantastic whole food. Technically they're fruit. They've got seeds. Um, if you've read Dr. Gundry's book on lectins, Tomatoes are high in lectins, and so there is a certain part of the population that react very strongly to lectins, and lectins create a lot of inflammation. And so in that population, most of the time, those are people with autoimmune issues, like rheumatoid arthritis and major inflammatory issues. For those people, tomatoes can be an issue. And so um, especially because if you consider lectins in foods, lectins are, the, are, are a foods, um, a plant's protective mechanism. You know, so for instance, a tomato does not want to be eaten when its seeds are not re- yet ready to germinate. So when a tomato is green, um, tomatoes don't want animals to eat them in that state. But lectin, is really, lectin count in tomatoes at that time is really high. And so an animal that ate a green tomato would get inflamed, wouldn't feel good, and wouldn't do that again. We, are, we don't learn quite so quickly as humans. You know, when we eat high lectin foods, we don't always give it up. And so one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of our food, because it is grown 
all over the world and we have the ability to ship it in, a lot of times foods are picked when they're not yet ripe. And so they use certain gases to make them look and to kind of ripen them up and make them look red, but the lectin count is still high. So tomatoes, if you're not sensitive to lectins, the best way to do tomatoes is grow them in your backyard. Get a little, a, a little potted you know, planter and plant some tomato plants. And if you do that, you will not be able to go back to store-bought tomatoes because they taste so much better when you grow them yourself. And so, yeah, but that's a good question. I mean, tomatoes are an excellent, an excellent whole food for people who aren't sensitive to lectins. So... All right, so we're going to jump into looking at how our diet has changed. And so, um, like I said, this we're going to go all the way back to kind of the ancestral diet because this was the diet our ancestors had for a long time. You know, if you look at in, in human history, you know, the, the modern diet is, is a relatively short amount of time. You know, we have radically shifted things, you know, and it's almost like our body hasn't quite caught up with all the, all the food shifts that have happened. And so we're going to kind of go back and look at an ancestral diet and look at what they ate, because that's a good idea as far as, you know, what, you know, we can properly digest and what is going to be best for us. And so when you look at kind of a hunter gatherer sort of culture, you know, they did a lot of plant matter, you know, so a lot of fiber, a lot of leaves, a lot of roots, a lot of berries, nuts and seeds. Um, you know, they did some protein, but unlike a lot of people who do paleo today, you know, they were not eating meat every meal, every day, you know, most of their diet was actually vegetable matter. And that's really important when it comes to our gut microbiome, because what fuels the ecosystem, the good bacteria in our gut is fiber. It's, it's all these, the prebiotic fiber that are in all these vegetables. And so, you know, even if you're doing something like the ketogenic diet, you know, where you're getting a lot of fat, you know, it, ketogenic is upwards to 80% of your diet from fat. The best delivery system for that fat is vegetables, you know, cook your vegetables and fat, you know, and, you know, you're not necessarily doing cream cheese fat bombs, you know, though some people do keto that way, that's not the healthy way to do it. It doesn't, it doesn't pass the 80% test, you know, cream cheese is not, not part of a whole foods diet, unfortunately. Um, so what we find is that these people rarely experience degenerative and inflammatory disease. Now, the counter argument to that is our ancestors had a life expectancy of about 30 to 35 years old, you know, and so most of us would probably agree we don't experience a lot of inflammation, you know, when we're young either. But the one thing I always tell my patients is don't accept the fact that just because you're getting older, that it's inevitable, you're going to have joint pain, or you're going to be more tired, or you're going to get cardiovascular disease. The only thing that changes the older you get is you have to work a lot harder, you know, because the big difference between somebody who's young, you know, who's pretty much under the age of 30 versus after is when you're young, you make a lot of stem cells. Your body's in this proliferative phase. You're growing, you know, that's typically when people were reproducing. And so you have all these floating stem cells that help heal your body from the damage of inflammation. And so, you know, so for those people that hit the age of 30 and they're like, oh my gosh, everything went downhill and I got, you know, all these injuries and all this pain, they were probably inflamed for quite some time prior to that. They just didn't feel the effects of that inflammation. Because like I said, inflammation breaks down tissue, but then the body comes in and heals. And if that healing process matches the breakdown process, you don't feel the effects of inflammation. But as you age, because your ability to heal does go down and go down and go down, you have to work a lot harder at keeping inflammation levels low. And so diet has to be much more of a priority. You know, exercise has to be much more of a priority. Sleep, all these things we know, you know, just have to become a much bigger priority because our body just can't heal as well as it did when we were young. I have a lot of patients that say, you know, I would love to get all the nutrients I need from my diet alone. And I a thousand percent agree that if we could do that, that would be great. But that gets harder and harder the older you get because you are dealing with more and more you know, inflammation and more, you know, damage in the body that, you know, your body just can't handle on its own without a little bit of extra support. 
Because even up through the 1950s, you know, the life expectancy, you know, was really only in the 50s and 60s. So even the fact that, you know, now we live into our 70s and 80s, you know, we're living 20 years longer than we did even 50 years ago. And so, you know, and we have the ability to do that, but to live a good quality life, you know, and to be able to regenerate and repair the way that um, we need to, to be comfortable, you do have to work harder and harder at that the older you get. So when we look at the ancestral diet, this is interesting. So, um, you know, the majority of their calories actually came from fat. You know, upwards to 60% of their calories came from, came from fat. Um, a lot of that was plant-based. Um, you know, the next uh, largest amount came from protein, and then a more negligible amount came from carbohydrates. And so, um, you know, so this whole idea of keto is kind of on the right on the right track, you know, but the keeping your insulin levels low, you know, so making sure you're getting more, more fat in your diet, less, you know, less, especially of the processed carbohydrates, more is going to mirror, you know, what our, our ancestors or how our ancestors ate. So when we look at the ancestral diet, you know, hunter gatherer sort of diet, they were getting a hundred percent of their diet from a whole food source. They didn't have any choice. <laughs> they didn't have a Dylan's or, you know, a, a grocery store to, to pick up food. Um, their omega six to three ratio was one to one. They had an equal amount because again, they're getting most of their food or they're getting all their food from a whole food source. A lot of that from nuts and seeds. The glycemic index was very low. Um, you know, their blood sugar, you know, stayed real low. Insulin levels stayed low. And, you know, another piece to their glycemic index, another thing that our ancestors ne didn't necessarily choose to do this, but as part of kind of their, 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 their life cycle, they had periods of fasting. You know, they had periods where food was not as readily available. You know, so the, the whole idea of, of having periods where we go without, where we fast, that brings your insulin levels, you know, back down. And so, you know, even incorporating periods of intermittent fasting can help, you know, lower inflammation levels and, and bring down insulin. And then, of course, their ORAC score was very high because they had lots of vegetable matter, you know, so they had a lot of these antioxidants and phytonutrients in their diet. So they were pretty well balanced. Their inflammation was balanced. You know, their, their risk, you know, in their lifetime was not of dying from cardiovascular disease. Their risk was dying from an infection, you know. And so, you know, that's part of the reason why we are able to live as long as we do is we have better sanitation. You know, we have antibiotics. And so because we are living longer and longer, as I mentioned, we're feeling the effects of inflammation more and more, especially the older we get. And so we just have to work harder, you know, to keep this, this in balance, you know, the older we get. So as we start to go into what's called the agricultural revolution, which, you know, a really, really great book to explore this idea. I don't have it written down here, but a really great book is by Dr. Gundry. Um, it's called The Plant Paradox. You know, and he talks about how, you know, with the introduction of more grains, you know, and then especially like we do today, the more we process those grains, the higher, you know, our inflammatory systems, you know, got the more, you know, we created more of that, that, that pro-inflammatory system. And so, you know, as we start to, you know, depend more and more on grains, not only for ourselves, but also for our livestock, um, you start to see an increase in those omega-6 fatty acids. Um, and a little bit of a sidebar, you know, one of the things that is, that's interesting is each of these different revolutions have happened for a reason. And the lifestyle of people that had the ability to grow grains was probably way better than the hunter gatherers. You know, hunter gatherers were like their primary existence was looking for food. And so the ability to grow food and to feed that to livestock and to grow livestock and eat that was a huge evolutionary advantage, you know, for, for humans. And so I don't want to discount the fact that, you know, each, each iteration of the diet that we've changed, especially even modern, even the processed food, you know, the ability to have food on the grocery store shelves has liberated women from, you know, being, you know, in the kitchen. It's liberated people from growing gardens. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's created more time in our life, but I think we're finally kind of catching up with the fact that there are 
consequences to eating that way. And so, um, so like I said, with this agricultural revolution, we start to see a little bit more of a shift, you know, so as you process and refine grains, not quite so much, um, in terms of whole foods, omega six to three ratios now shifted five to one, which is not bad. When I see a five to one ratio on a lab, you know, I get really excited because I don't see that very often in today's, today's values. Um, glycemic index is again, not quite as great because the grains impact blood sugar more. And then ORAC score is not quite as great because some of these grains start to replace the vegetable matter that, that our ancestors used to, used to forage for. So you start to see just a little bit of a shift, a little bit of a a change, you know, more toward the pro-inflammatory side. So probably the biggest shift happened during the industrial revolution. And, you know, there's not a, for any of these, there's not a real greatly defined, it was this year to this year sort of time period. But the way I kind of define this industrial revolution period is this is around the era when food became less about just sustenance and it became more about business. You know, so this is when, you know, food companies started to develop processes to sell more food, to make it last longer, you know, to make it taste better, all those different things, you know, they started to kind of manipulate our food. Food science really started to come into its own. And so I kind of put this right around the end of World War II era, you know, maybe a little prior World War I, World War II era. Um, But this is when we start really processing foods, separating fats, refining grains, refining sugar, you know, white bread, you know, tastes a whole lot better than the, the, the whole wheat bread. Um, and what starts to happen is we start to replace all the nutrient dense foods we were eating with these more poorly refined foods. And so, and again, I always tell the story about my grandma who's in her late eighties and how, you know, I can remember my husband and I were growing a garden and I was telling her about how we were canning the tomatoes and making all these different things. And she looks at me and she's like, Annie, she's like, you can buy canned tomatoes for 99 cents at the grocery store. She's like, why would you go through all this effort to grow it? And, you know, cause in her mind, she grew up on the farm here in Kansas with nine sisters and they, they, they had to grow most of what they ate. And so for her, when she had a family of her own and she was able just to go to the grocery store and pick this stuff up, that was life changing, you know? And so, like I said, as we got into this era, it was thinking more along the lines of how do we make people's lives better and more efficient and easier? How do we make food less expensive? You know, and um, with that though, there are some health consequences that we're learning. One statistic that's interesting that I think this was actually in Michael Pollan's book is he said back in the 1950s, people used to spend, um, 15% of their budget on food and less than 5% on healthcare. And now those numbers have switched, you know, that we are spending less on our food, but a larger percent of our budget on healthcare. And so it's kind of an interesting, interesting number to look at, you know, that the less expensive food gets, the sicker we get. You know, and, and, and that's always, you know, people always ask me, they're like, well, you know, like organic food is so expensive or vegetables are so much more expensive. And, you know, and I, and I always, I always kind of flip that question. And the better question is not why are vegetables and whole foods more expensive, but why is all this other food so cheap? And when you start to look at why it's so cheap and the ingredients that they're using, it makes sense, you know, why they're able to sell it for a lot less. So during this time period, we're down to 65% of the diet from a whole food source. Omega-6 to 3 ratio is now 10 to 1. So we're definitely more shifting into a pro-inflammatory state. Glycemic index is really high, um, you know, and then the ORAC score is low. And, you know, what's interesting about the glycemic index, um, I don't know if anybody's heard that, you know, they have termed Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, you know, so the great generation, the ones that are ending up end of life with dementia and Alzheimer's, you know, this sort of more refined diet, you know, they've, they've had, you know, about half their life, more than half their life. You know, when you start looking at baby boomer who were raised on a lot of this stuff, we're seeing those rates of dementia and Alzheimer's show up a lot earlier, you know, in people in their 60s and 70s. And so, you know, that inflammatory, you know, you know, diet in that that lack of, of you know, regulation of blood sugar 
eventually kind of caught up with them, which it terrifies me for kids these days, because when you look at what kids are eating today, I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty unbelievable, not only in terms of, you know, the candy and the sodas that they're drinking, but when you look at all the healthy foods, the yogurt, you know, your kids yogurt, it's a health food. Well, a tube of yogurt could have 15 grams of sugar in it, you know, for kids, you know, and juice is a healthy food. You know, they need apple juice or, I mean, so it's like all these things that kids are eating have all this added sugar. And then you add on top of it, all the extra sugar, all the candy, all the, all the other snacks that they're getting. And I mean, kids these days are just overloaded. I, I would say uh, at least half of the ADHD kids that I see in my practice, um, a lot of the root of their issues are dysregulation in blood sugar. Kids are just, they're, they're hangry, you know, and so they act out, you know, and when kids, when they get brain fatigue, they don't get tired like we do. They get more wound up. And so stabilizing their blood sugar, giving them a high fat, you know, high fiber, high protein sort of breakfast changes their day for them. So this is where we're at after the industrial revolution, way more toward a pro-inflammatory state. Um, and then all these things that help protect us, these, the ORAC score, the glycemic index, all these whole foods, all these things that should help protect us against inflammation are getting smaller. So then that gets, brings us to our our diet today, our convenience fast food revolution, which I keep, I keep saying I'm going to do this and I probably need to add another, another slide after this because I do feel like the pendulum is switching and I do feel like people are waking up more and more. And I do feel that there is a grassroots movement more toward whole foods, more toward healthy eating. And, um, you know, the evidence of that is when you just look at all these big companies that are making, you know, their foods organic, that they're pulling out all the, you know, MSG out of their foods. I mean, they're making changes, not because it's better for their bottom line, but because people aren't buying their products anymore. And so I think we are evolving past just this whole idea of, you know, fast food, but we still do a lot of this. You know, we are still in this convenience revolution where even if we're not eating out every meal, think about all the different foods you use that come in a package to prepare your dinner. You know, how much of your dinner are you preparing from fresh fruits and vegetables and, you know, from, from a whole food source. And so, you know, we still have this convenience, convenience mentality, even down to, I mean, I, I think it's, 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 it's a move in the right direction, but you know, the meal subscription boxes you get, you know, I, it's real food, you know, so it's, it's again, a step in the right direction, but it's still coming in a package. We don't, you know, we're, we're not involved with, you know, with, we're not connected with the food that we're eating as much. So in today's, we've got a lot of highly refined foods, low intake of vegetables. If we do get vegetables, a lot of times they are from a can or they've been, you know, changed and morphed to where a lot of the nutritional value is no longer there. Um, a lot of not only, you know, oils that are used, but hydrogenated oils, oils that are heated. So you're breaking, you know, hydrogen bonds and creating trans fats. A um, lot of chemical preservatives, you know, that are there for a uh, longer shelf life. Um, a lot of artificial natural flavorings. A lot of the stuff we talked about in the class we did on, on food additives, but a lot of that has come about within the past 20 to 30, 30 years. So today we are getting about 35% of our diet from a whole food source. Um, omega-6 to 3 ratio, like I mentioned, is 20 to 1. Regularly, I review labs that are 30 to 1, 50 to 1, 60 to 1. You know, so, and this is not just in people who are you know, over the age of 40 or 50. I mean, these are young people, too, that, that have you know, this, this, this inflammation that's out of balance. Um, glycemic index is very high. You know, just look at you know, the crippling costs of diabetes in our, in our country today. And, you know, and that, is, that is all blood sugar related. Diabetes is one of, one of the most preventable chronic diseases out there. You know, a, a majority of it goes back to your diet. And, you know, family history and genetics play a role in that. But your family history only determines how hard you have to work to maintain your blood sugar. Some people have to work a lot harder than others. But, um, but it's one of the most preventable chronic diseases we have. Um, and it's exorbitantly expensive, you know, for our healthcare system. Um, and then ORAC score is very low, you know, so not very many 
colors in our diet. And so I, I, I think I shared this in one of the previous classes, but, you know, when you look at where our food is coming from, you know, there's, there's a few big players that control most of our food supply. And the food supply being food that comes in a package. You know, your best source of food is, like I said, to grow it yourself or make friends with a local farmer. We've got some fantastic farmer's markets here in Wichita. We even now have farmer's markets year-round. There's an indoor farmer's market in Old Town. So, you know, so we've got year-round access to a lot of these vegetables. Um, there are CSAs. There's one called Bountiful Baskets where you can get vegetables that are from local farmers um, that are in season. And, you know, so, you know, making that kind of the basis of what you eat is it goes speaks to that 80 percent, you know, focusing on the 80 percent, because, you know, as soon as you start incorporating, you know, all of these different, you know, packaged foods, not only are you not getting the nutritional, you know, value, but you're also eating foods that will steal nutrients. You know, when you eat a highly refined you know, carbohydrate or sugar diet, that's actually stealing magnesium and it's stealing minerals from your body. So, um, you know, so as much as you can try and keep things, eat things that are not in a package. So this is where we're at today in our modern diet, way more, you know, pro-inflammatory, 20 times the amount of pro-inflammatory mediators, um, you know, and, you know, significantly less, you know, in terms of the things we need to help balance out that that inflammatory response. And so this is why, I mean, you know, a lot of chronic diseases are not only on the rise, but they're showing up earlier and earlier. You know, it's why we've got a lot of digestive issues in kids. It's why we've got a lot of women in their 20s and 30s with autoimmunity and infertility and, you know, hormonal issues. I mean, it's all, all of this can go back to what we're eating. And as I mentioned in the previous class, you know, food truly is the most powerful form of medicine, but it is dose dependent. You know, you can't, you know, just eat, you know, spinach one day and that, that protects you. It's a consistent dosing over a long period of time and it's getting a variety of different foods. So I always, I always, I always, Give people these 16, these are 16, no, 14 different, you know, ideas. Cause I've, I've kind of gone through all the negatives of don't do this, don't do that. And so what does an anti-inflammatory diet look like? Realistically, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And so, of course, my number one is eat a variety of fresh and whole foods. So what does that look like? You know, so breakfast might be eggs, you know, it might be avocado on almond flour toast, you know, it might be a smoothie where you've got fresh, you know, berries with spinach and um, flax seeds and, you know, uh, almond butter, or you throw a handful of walnuts in, you know, so it's, it's lots of color and it's real food. So lunch might be, you know, a salad. And I always tell people, don't make wimpy salads. You know, if you're going to have a salad, put a whole avocado on there, put a couple hard boiled eggs, put a big handful of pistachios, get full fat dressing made or make it yourself with olive oil. You know, make your salad a really hearty salad, get lots of vegetables, make it taste really good. You know, I mean, it shouldn't be this iceberg lettuce, you know, with just, you know, the, the, the fat free vinaigrette, you know, with, you know, some shredded carrots, you know, I mean, that is not a, that is not a meal. That is not a salad. And so, um, you know, you might do lettuce wraps, you know, dinner, when you look at your dinner plate, 75% of your plate is vegetables with protein. And those vegetables are cooked in good quality fats. That, that is a whole foods sort of diet. And that leaves some room that if you want to have, you know, a little bit of, you know, a chocolate bar after dinner, or you want to have a, you know, piece of bread, you know, that still leaves 20% wiggle room, but focus on getting that real food. Um, eat more fish. So especially the cold water, fresh caught varieties, um, which is difficult here in Kansas, but still possible. Um, eat grass fed lean meats. This is more realistic for us. You know, we've got a lot of great sources of good quality meat. Um, eat a lot of colorful vegetables, you know, so not just vegetables, but a variety of different vegetables, lots of different colors. Um, and then use spices and herbs to flavor your food. Just because, you know, you're eating real food and healthy food doesn't mean it should taste bad. You know, when you're putting good fats on, when you're putting good quality sea salt, when you're using herbs and spices, 
That is what people pay hundreds of dollars for at gourmet restaurants. It's the fresh ingredients and it's all the different flavors that, that are used. Um, use olive oil, coconut oil. I mean, olive oil for low heat, coconut oil more for high heat. Um, but even things like avocado oil and walnut oil, all those oils are, are great anti-inflammatory sort of oils. Question, yeah. It's a good question. More omega nines in, in coconut oil. And coconut oil is more of kind of a, a saturated fat. So it's more of an anti-inflammatory fat. And so coconut oil is really high in something called medium chain triglycerides, which is a really great energy source for us. You know, and so if anybody's heard of something called bulletproof coffee, you know, people who do keto do, you know, a little bit of the MCT or coconut oil in their coffee with, with butter. And that's a pure fat you know, sort of snack that gives you energy but doesn't stimulate an insulin response. So coconut oil is, um, is more kind of a combination. And so, um, so identify food sensitivities and allergens. You know, so if you are allergic to eggs, even though eggs are an excellent source of protein, excellent source of choline, I love it when people eat eggs. If you're allergic to it, it's going to be triggering inflammation for you. So, um, you know, you can do blood tests to identify food sensitivities, but still the best tried and true way is to do an elimination challenge. So if you suspect dairy or you suspect corn or you suspect wheat, take it out of your diet, you know, for 30 to 60 days and see how you feel. Reintroduce it. And if you are reacting to those foods, you'll have a much stronger reaction when you reintroduce it. So identify what those food sensitivities are, because those can kind of be a constant thorn in your side um, and constantly be triggering inflammation. This one right here, this movie, this, this is a documentary called Food, Inc. I think it's still on Netflix. If, if, you've, if you've got access to it, watch that documentary. It is a fantastic look at where our food comes from and... I have had more people, um, you know, either go vegetarian or, you know, give up a lot of different foods based on, on this, this movie, just because you actually see where a lot of our food comes from. All right. Number eight, eventual, uh, avoid conventional vegetable cooking oils, you know, so your canola oils, you're much better off using things like coconut oil or avocado oil, you know, some of those high heat oils. I mean, I even tell people, you know, we, we tend to categorize fried foods as bad, which, you know, of course, the higher you cook, of the higher heat you use to cook a food, you are going to destroy more enzymes and nutrients. But if you're frying something, fry it in a little bit of coconut oil. And it's not, it, it's not that technique that's bad. For most of the stuff we eat, it's the oils we're using to fry those foods in. And so um, not that, like I said, you want to do that for every meal, but as a treat, you know, using the right oils, that can be, you know, an appropriate cooking technique. Um, avoid or limit all refined sugars, especially high fructose corn syrup, um, which we talked about high, high fructose corn syrup and fructose in, um, I believe it was the first class. We talked about how your body metabolizes fructose differently than, than glucose, but all in all, just staying away from sugar in general is, is your best bet. And what almost every person who does keto or who does fasting, or who starts to remove a lot of this stuff out of their diet, they're amazed at number one, how they stop craving sugar. You know, they stop wanting it. And then number two, how they are less hungry all the time. It's like, you're not, you don't realize when your blood sugar is dysregulated, you don't realize how much you think about food and you think about your next meal because your brain and your body are constantly thinking you're starving. The more you get sugar out of your diet, the, the more satisfied, the more full you're going to be and the less you're going to want it. And you even get to a point where like now, I mean, most sugar things don't even look appealing to me anymore. And this is coming from, you know, a sugar holic, you know, 10 years ago. Um, avoid or limit intake of refined grains. Grains are just inflammatory. You know, unfortunately, you know, it's, I, I think a lot of it is what we're spraying on our grains. I think a lot of it is the herbicides, the fungicides, you know, they, they're, you can see, you know, the difference, you know, when you eat wheat sprayed with glyphosate, that creates leakiness in the gut. It creates permeability, you know, in those, in that cell membrane. And so even doing the, you know, whole grain 
wheat is still for a, a lot of people going to be inflammatory. And so not that you have to, you know, forever and ever, you know, go gluten free, but just be mindful of that, that if you're eating that on a constant basis and you still have your inflammatory issues, it might be, it might be one of those grains that's triggering it. Um, limit your intake of dairy. Dairy is one of those, again, a lot of people will say completely eliminate it. Um, you know, I, if you are sensitive to it and if it is a food, food allergy, then yes, definitely eliminate it. Most people can do a little bit of dairy, you know, a little bit of cheese, a little bit using it as a garnish. Um, but we are not baby cows. We don't have the same amount of lactase enzyme as a baby cow. So we can't handle the quantity of dairy that most people eat. And in that regard, it can become inflammatory. Um, number 12, snack on nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds, if you are not allergic to them, nuts and seeds are one of the best you know, snacks because they travel well, they're balanced in omega-3s and omega-6s, they're high in fiber, they're filling. Um, you know, so they are a fantastic snack to, to kind of keep on hand. Um, when you're thirsty, drink water. You know, that's another thing we talk about, I think, in the first class is all the sugar that sneaks into the drinks that we're drinking. You know, it's a Gatorade here with 30 grams of sugar. It's an apple juice there with 20 grams of sugar. It's a Starbucks with 60 grams of sugar. You know, all of that kind of sneaks into um, into the, the, the drinks that we're drinking. And so, you know, if you're thirsty, try and drink water or herbal teas or black coffee, you know, you know, all of those, you know, will, you know, are, are much better in the, in, without any of the added sugar in them. And then number 14, eat organic as much as possible, which again, if you watch the food additives class, we go into all the different effects, you know, of, of glyphosate um, and the, 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 just the sheer volume that's being used. You know, this is, a, this is a graph that shows that, you know, prior to the mid 90s, there was about, you know, uh, 15 million pounds of, of glyphosate that was used annually. And today we're pushing close to 300,000. I'm sorry, 300 million pounds of Roundup used per year. And again, in cross sections, this is shown to contribute to leaky gut. And so, um, so buying organic, washing your fruits and vegetables, um, you know, can limit your exposure. Now, what's, what's amazing too is eating the right foods will protect you. You know, so I, I don't know if anybody's heard of the amino acid called glutamine, L glutamine. L glutamine is needed for your your enterocytes or the cells that line your digestive tract to heal. Well, glutamine is, is high in protein, animal proteins. And so getting good quality animal proteins, having the stomach acid to digest those proteins, you're giving your body, you know, what it needs to heal. And so, you know, so it's, it's important to, 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 like I said, not only focus on staying away from the processed food because it's not good for us, but it also just doesn't provide us anything. It provides us calories, but most of those calories just get stored as fat. And most of us don't, don't, don't have a problem with our storage. <laughs> All right. So um, in terms of organics, you know, um, most of you have probably seen this list. This is called the Dirty Dozen. It's put out by a group called the Environmental Working Group. These are the 12 worst fruits, fruits and vegetables in terms of pesticides. So these have the most amount of pesticides sprayed on them. So these are the ones that are the most important to buy organic. So always buy your strawberries organic. Always buy your apples, your applesauce, anything apple derivative, buy organic. And so, um, you know, so these are some of people's favorites. But all of these are very easy to find at not only Dillon's, but Walmart and Target and Costco. They have all of these um, or most of these, um, they have organic options. And they are a little bit more expensive. But again, in the long term, you know, because, you know, of the um, effects you have on your digestion, getting the conventional stuff over and over again um, can, will contribute to, you know, to more digestive issues. They even recently me measured, there was a, the Environmental Working Group measured um, amount of pesticides in certain processed foods. You know, so they looked at things like honey nut Cheerios, things that like oats and stuff, and conventional were really high in um, glyphosate, you know, versus the organic versions um, had little to no, you know, uh, glyphosate in them. So people always ask, is it worth it? And 
I say yes, it's definitely worth it. The Clean 15, these are some of the ones that they use less pesticides on. So if it's not in the budget, these are the ones that, you know, you maybe it's not quite as important, you know, like bananas. Bananas have a skin. A lot of the, you know, the pesticides they spray don't get actually get as much into the bananas. So some of these might not be quite as important um, to buy organic. All right, so we've got about eight minutes left, and so I'm going to roll through all the rest of this pretty quickly because, um, you know, that first section looking at the balance of inflammation, you know, and especially what we're eating and how that influences inflammation is so important to kind of set us up to talk about the gut because where most of this inflammation is occurring is in the gut. And, you know, even though we where we feel it might be in the joints or it might be on our skin or it might be... In the brain, brain inflammation is is huge for a lot of people. Where most of this is getting triggered is in the gut because that's where our gut is where we get the most amount of exposure to things from the outside world. You know, we think our skin is what would get the most exposure, but our skin is an intact barrier system. We all have bacteria crawling all over our skin, but unless you've got a cut in your skin, that bacteria is not getting into the bloodstream. So you can think about the lining of the gut, especially the lining of the small intestine, kind of like a skin on the inside of your organs. And what's happening with leaky gut is it's like we're getting cuts all along that lining. And so everything we eat, all these things we get exposed to in our diet, rather than being filtered out, are making their way into the bloodstream. And that's leaky gut. That's what's creating inflammation. And the longer you kind of stir that inflammation up in the gut, that is, your body has a mechanism called cytokines. And they're, it's like a, a messenger system. And those cytokines travel all over the body and they carry that message of inflammation everywhere. You know, this is why, you know, leaky gut is such a big topic of conversation because a lot of it starts in the gut. And so controlling what you eat can control inflammation all over the body. And so um, Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut, you know, and he said that, what, 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago, which is so true, you know, and even more so true today. So we're going to kind of talk about what happens when the system starts to break down. And a lot of times the reason it is breaking down is because of what we're eating, you know, but in addition to what we're eating, it's also the overuse of antibiotics, you know, it's, um, you know, different foreign food products, you know, so all these things, that whole additives class that we had, you know, a few months ago, all those things that our body doesn't recognize, it doesn't know what to do with. And so it has to detoxify them in the liver. And a lot of that gets stored either in our fat cells or it gets stored in the liver or in the brain. Um, and so we can get this bioaccumulation of, of chemicals in the body. Um, so if you've wondered, do I have leaky gut, you know, is, you know, I, I have a lot of patients that say, well, I don't have any digestive issues, but then we get their labs back and they've got all the values elevated for leaky gut. And so any of these con conditions, whether you've got GI issues or not, can be connected to leaky gut, you know. So if you get regular constipation or regular diarrhea or alternation between the two, if you have heartburn, gas, bloating, burping, headaches, migraines, very, very common with detox, um, depression, anxiety, weight gain, weight loss, skin issues. 99% of the kids I see with eczema, it's related to their gut. It's related to what they're eating. It's related to leaky gut. So eczema, acne, hives and rashes, a high histamine response um, is related to the gut. Um, ADD, ADHD, brain fog, um, joint pain. I can't tell you how many patients I have that have given up wheat and they are shocked that their joint pain goes away, you know? And so, um, and it's connected to not just the wheat, but also the inflammatory response it creates. Um, fatigue, um, how many people get tired, you know, same time every afternoon or maybe an hour or two after you eat, you get, you get tired, you know, that's a sign of inflammation. Um, and then allergies, whether that's food allergies or seasonal allergies, that's all triggered in the gut.
I always tell people, I actually, for years, starting in high school, was on thyroid medication. And and I worked for years to try and balance that. And I had adrenal symptoms. And it wasn't, even though I didn't have any GI symptoms, it wasn't until I gave up wheat that all of a sudden my adrenals balanced out and I was able to come off of my thyroid medication. And so for me, th- those three things, adrenals, thyroid, gut, are a, a triad. And they all play off of one another. And so... And a lot of it for a lot of people is related to the gut. So in terms of the gut, a few concepts I want to just kind of review are our microbiome. You know, our microbiome is the bacterial cells that are either in us or on us. Now, we now know these bacterial cells outnumber our own cells 10 to 1. So we have 10 times the amount of bacteria in us or on us or even around us. You know, I was, I think it was last class I was talking about the bacterial cloud that we all have and our clouds are intermixing right now, kind of like pig pen, you know, from the peanuts, you know, cartoon, you know, we all have this bacterial ecosystem and we barely scratch the surface in terms of what this system does. But we do know that when this system gets out of balance, it leaves us much more prone to inflammatory conditions, brain-based conditions, um, obesity, high um, cholesterol, high lipid levels. Um, you know, so we've connected a lot of this with this bacterial system. But because we don't know that much about the specifics of it, still the very best thing for this ecosystem is eating a high fiber sort of diet, eating lots of plants, um, you know, eating, you know, a, a rich prebiotic diet. So, you know, a lot of people know the things that build, you know, if you're doing fermented foods that will build that good bacteria. So yogurt, no sugar added yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, kombucha, kombucha is a fantastic, um, you know, uh, provide a uh, fermented drink that provides good bacteria. Um, miso, tempeh, apple cider vinegar. Of course, you can take probiotic supplements. The one thing with probiotics I've found with my patients is it's very much dose dependent. A lot of times people who are having gut issues or constipation who are taking 10 billion, you know, of a probiotic, they're just not getting enough. You know, so you might need 20 billion or 50 billion or 100 billion, you know, and even in kids, I've dosed them up that high. And it's not until you get into some of the higher doses that you start to see alleviation you know, of the, um, of the symptoms. And that's just a testament to how out of balance our ecosystem is. Now, certain things I just want to touch on real fast that destroy the microbiome. Of course, we know about antibiotics. You know, if we take an antibiotic, that will decimate our, our gut flora for a period. But 80% of antibiotics in the United States are used in livestock. So you have to be careful with your conventional meat, your um, conventional dairy, those can be high in antibiotics. Um, artificial sweeteners, if you're still doing diet soda or, you know, certain gums or, you know, low sugar, you know, candies or foods that are, that have any of these artificial sweeteners, you know, a one packet of Splenda will kill about half your gut flora. So these artificial sweeteners have a big impact on on our, our, our microbiome. And then certain chemicals, you know, so chlorine, chlorine's used in our water system to help kill bacterial infections in the water, which is good. We don't want bacterial infections in our water, but if not all of that chlorine is filtered out by the time it gets to your house, that chlorine in the water you're drinking can disrupt your microbiome, can also disrupt your, the biome on your skin. You know, so if you've got chronic skin inflammatory issues, you might need a chlorine filter you know, um, on your shower heads. Um, fluoride is another one, you know, that, you know, uh, it's debatable in toothpaste, but definitely in water, you know, water that we're drinking that's fortified with fluoride disrupts the microbiome. And as I mentioned, pesticides and herbicides play, um, play a big role in the disruption of our microbiome as well. And we talked, like I said, a lot about that in the food additives class. So when we look at what is actually happening, what is the mechanism of leaky gut look like? This is a cross section of your small intestine. So let me go back real fast, just so people you have kind of an orientation. You know, when we eat food, it goes down the esophagus into the stomach. Stomach breaks down proteins, has acid. It's a big muscle. It churns. The food leaves the stomach. Pancreas dumps enzymes in right here. And then our food travels all the way through this small intestine. You know, we've got all this, 
you know, all this, these, this, you know, hundreds of feet of intestine that, um, as the food is traveling along, this is where we start absorbing everything. You know, so this is where we start absorbing fats and proteins and minerals and nutrients and sugars. Um, so when we talk about leaky gut, we're talking about the small intestine right here. The large intestine or the colon, this is primarily waste removal. You know, so this is once the food gets all the way through the small intestine, by the time it's gotten to the colon, it, that the colon's job is primarily to continue to get rid of it. Now, where most of our microbiome exists is in the colon. And the reason being is there are a lot of things that we can't digest that the bacteria can digest. And as the, the bacteria starts to digest some of those fibers that are those prebiotic fibers, you know, some of those fibers that are in the food, the, the bacteria can actually generate energy off of that, that we get, you know, the advantage of. And so, um, you know, so most of the good bacteria, when we talk about the microbiome is in the large intestine. And I always tell people, you know, when you have a bowel movement, about 75% of your bowel movement is actually bacteria. And a lot of that bacteria is sloughing off the wall of this colon. And that's part of what kind of helps helps us further digest some of those fibers. And, you know, we get benefit and in, in energy and propionic acid and all these other, you know, you know, great sources, butyric acid, which we talked about last class. Um, we get that from the bacteria that are in our colon. So when we talk about leaky gut, like I said, this is a very zoomed in cross section of the small intestine. And the small intestine only has one cell layer that protects us from all the food that's floating by in the, in the small intestine in our bloodstream. So in, an, in a healthy individual, in a healthy gut, we've got all these, these tight junctions between each of these cells so that any food that's floating by has to be absorbed across these little hairs right here, you know, along the lining, and it goes through the cell into the bloodstream. That way the body has total control over what gets absorbed and what gets eliminated. When you have leaky gut, these proteins break down. And so now all of a sudden, rather than going through the cell, all of these different food proteins and, you know, bacteria and all that can make their way in between the cells and they get straight into the bloodstream. And since the immune system is in the bloodstream that surrounds the gut, it's a highly reactive system. You know, so anything that makes its way through, the immune system immediately quarantines, tags, and gets rid of it. And so, which in the short term works, but when people have leaky gut for years and years and years, and you start getting this, this, this overactivation of the immune system, the overactivation of the inflammatory system, that's where you start, we start developing all these cytokines that start carrying that message of inflammation all over the body. And that's where your immune system stops being able to recognize who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? And our immune system starts attacking our healthy cells and we start developing autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is on the rise. Hashimoto's, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, all these autoimmune conditions are on the rise in younger and younger people. And a lot of that goes back to the gut and, and kind of what is um, triggering that, that immune response. All right, and this is actually, this is kind of somebody who's got celiac. You can actually get destruction of, these are what are called your enterocytes. And so, you know, so when that happens, that is, that's where you have really poor, you know, really poor absorption, a lot of inflammation. That's kind of a long-term progress sort of inflammatory response. So what breaks down our gut lining? Like I said, I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, so gluten, gliadin, there's a protein in gluten called gliadin, whether you're celiac or not creates an inflammatory response that breaks down the lining of our gut. That's what I mentioned earlier. This has been shown on, a, on microscopic cross-sections that um, gliadin and then also glyphosate that is on, that's sprayed on a lot of this, um, creates a, a leakiness in the gut. Um, stress, you know, chronic stress, you know, so that creates reduced blood flow, altered motility, and increased permeability um, when we're under stress. You know, that's why has anybody ever gotten a stomach ache, you know, when you're under stress or you start to get, you know, irritable bowel, you know, the grumblings, you know, when you're under stress, you know, stress affects our digestion pretty significantly. 
Um, dysbiosis. This, this number three and number four are probably the two most common reasons I see people have leaky gut. Um, dysbiosis is an overgrowth of the wrong bacteria. So a lot of patients have um, overgrowth of a type of bacteria called Clostridia, or it's, you know, a certain strain of it that's best known is called C. diff. If you've ever heard about that in the hospital, you know, people have clostridia strains kind of at lower, lower thresholds that just are populating in their ecosystem. A lot of people have yeast, a lot of different yeast strains or candida strains, and that chronic sort of infection there chronically creates inflammation. And like I said, especially a lot of the kids I see have have this. And a lot of it is it's that that ecosystem gets out of balance. You know, it's the perfect storm of them not eating enough fiber, not eating enough anti-inflammatory foods, not getting enough of the good bacteria, eating processed foods that are high in glyphosate that destroy, you know, the good bacteria. And you just create this ecosystem that's completely out of balance. Um, environmental contaminants, you know, so like I mentioned, um, you know, the chlorine, fluoride, um, heavy metals, mercury, if you've got mercury fillings, you know, and you're constantly, you know, releasing that mercury gas, you swallow that in your saliva and it goes down into the gut and that can create a chronic inflammatory response in the gut. Um, food additives, preservatives, pesticides, like I mentioned, we did that whole class on all of that and the connection to the gut. Um, and then certain drugs, you know, certain drugs, when you use over a long period of time, you know, they, um, they create more of an inflammatory, well, it's not that they're creating more of an inflammatory response, it's they're dampening the anti inflammatory response. So it's a double negative there, but they create more inflammation because they're dampening the anti inflammatory response in the body. So what does leaky gut have to do with the rest of our symptoms? As I mentioned, our immune system has messengers called cytokines, and they carry the message of inflammation from the gut to the thyroid, to the brain, to the joints, the muscles, the adrenal glands, you know, our bones, all over the body. This message of inflammation, you know, gets transmitted. And depending on kind of where your weakness is, that's where you feel this inflammatory response. All right, so how do we heal the gut? In addition to changing diet, changing diet is step number one. Um, you know, I was, you know, there's four steps, and step number one is remove any of the triggers, you know, that are there. And that's the whole first half of the class that we did. You know, but once you've kind of removed food allergens, triggers, inflammatory foods, the second step is to look at replacing certain things in the diet. So if you've got low stomach acid, you know, if you're constantly burping, clearing your throat, if you've got acid reflux, bloating, undigested material in your stools or fat in your stools, those are a sign of either low stomach acid or low digestive enzymes. Um, if, um, you know, re-inoculate, so getting that prebiotic fiber and good probiotics in your diet to help replenish, you know, that ecosystem, and then the last is repair, you know, and this is something we we do a lot of work with, especially with some of our chronically ill patients here at the Reardon Clinic, because a lot of our patients have had leaky gut for so long that they're not able to absorb these nutrients. And when they can't absorb these nutrients, they can't effectively heal their gut. And when they can't heal their gut, that inflammation continues to perpetuate. So some of the most important nutrients in terms of healing the gut are minerals like zinc and magnesium. Um, B vitamins are extremely important. L-glutamine is an amino acid. Um, One of my new favorites, which this is something that I've been doing a lot more research in here lately, it's kind of an old thing, but sulfur. You know, you think about, you know, so MSM, methyl sulfur, you know, methyl sulfur methionine is a, MSM is a um, methyl donor and a sulfur donor. You need that to heal leaky gut. And, um, you know, in addition to allergies and adrenals and, you know, there's a lot of different processes that the body needs both of those those, those substrates for the methyl groups and the sulfur. And um, so I've been using a lot more MSM with patients, especially the ones that have the chronic, you know, sort of allergies, the ones that have the chronic food sensitivities, the ones that are doing the diet, they're doing everything, but yet they still have a little bit of inflammation in their gut. The MSM has been working beautifully to help heal that. And we've been dosing it up pretty high too. 
these are all different um, nutrients or compounds that help control inflammation. So they're good for inflammation all over the body, but also really good for inflammation in the gut. You know, so curcumin, you know, a lot of people are on curcumin. A lot of doctors are putting people on curcumin because it's so well established in the research that it's anti-inflammatory. Vitamin D, um, glutathione, resveratrol. Um, we talked about fish oils. All of those work with the body's own inflammatory systems to balance inflammation. You know, when you take an NSAID drug, when you take an Advil, all you're doing is stopping the production, you know, of those prostaglandins, which trigger inflammation. When you do things like fish oil, you do things, you know, these anti-inflammatory compounds, you work on both sides of the equation to create that balance in the body. And anytime you can use these natural substances, the body's going to use them more intuitively compared to a drug. So where do I start? Like I said, there's the 14 things that, that I mentioned, um, but if you want an even more condensed list, number one, get rid of sugar. Start with that. Get a, you know, Start with all the obvious sugar. Don't buy the donuts. Don't buy the sweets. But then start looking for the hidden sugar in you know, all of these different foods you know, that you could possibly eat. Um, reduce additives and preservatives. So don't buy anything in a box. Or if you do, look for the organic version. I mean, it's never been easier to eat healthy because if you love Doritos, you can find an organic form of Doritos that, you know, uses natural spices. It doesn't have MSG in it. And probably you can even find some that doesn't, don't even have corn, you know, so, you know, so you can, you can move your way into, you know, making better food choices as you are on your way to going toward 80% whole foods in your diet. Increase good fats and proteins. Um, as I said, if you're getting rid of sugar, then the, the other you know, source of fuel for the body, better source of fuel for the body is actually fat. So if you're decreasing your sugar, you've got to increase those good quality fats. Um, oops. Decrease simple carbohydrates. Like I said, um, you know, it, get rid of sugar, but then start looking at all these processed carbohydrates, which pretty much have the same effect as sugar in the body in terms of your blood sugar. And then number five, if you can't do anything else, just drink more water. And that will start to kind of help alleviate, you know, possibly some of the, some of the hunger that you have um, and get rid of some of the excess sugar that you might be consuming in, um, you know, in some of the sports drinks or high sugar drinks that, that you know, tend to kind of sneak into, sneak into our diet. And so... That is it. So I will be happy to stick around. If anybody has any questions, we, we're still live streaming. And so I can answer questions kind of over the live stream, um, you know, or if, um, if not, I'm happy to stick around if anybody has any questions after, afterwards as well. Dr. Ann, we have uh, one from the Internet. Okay. Um, the question is, with Ramadan starting, what is your recommendation before fasting and breaking the fast? And just for background, for those who aren't familiar, the fast is from 3 a.m. to 10 p.m. And it is a complete fast, which includes both food and liquids, including water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. And, you know, and it, it, that raises a really great point that as part of a lot of different cultural and religious practices, fasting has always been part of part of our, our norm, you know, and I, like I said, I think there's an intuitiveness behind that. Um, so probably the best way to prepare for a fast is um, to cu cut excess carbohydrates and sugar, you know, a, about a week or two, depending on how much you consume, you know, prior to your fast, because, you know, the, the reason we get hungry um, is because our blood sugar is dropping. And so, I mean, we were designed to be able to go for long periods. Like I, I do an intermittent fast of 16 hours every day. My time frame is a little bit different. I do about nine o'clock at night until like I haven't eaten lunch today. So today it'll be probably closer to, you know, two o'clock before I have my first meal. And, um, if you ask me, yes, I'm hungry, I could eat, but it's because you, when you, when you train your body to get into, to switch into that ketosis, to burn fat, you really don't feel hunger in the same way you do when your blood sugar drops. 
you know, blood sugar dropping is that I can't stop thinking about food all day, you know, every day sort of feeling versus you know, when you're in ketosis, you could eat, but if you get busy enough, you forget about it and you kind of move on. And so probably the best way to prepare for a fast like that is to, um, is to, to lower the amount of carbohydrates. You know, the number, if you, if you want a number, you know, less than 20 to 30 grams of carbohydrates, you know, for a couple of weeks prior to the fast. I mean, and this is a good practice for anybody, you know, to practice getting into ketosis, but it can take a little bit of time to retrain your body how to burn fat. And so I always kind of equate it to a hybrid car. You know, in, in, a, in a hybrid car, you can burn the gasoline or you can burn the battery. And um, the, there are advantages to both. You know, the gas, you need the gasoline to go really fast, to speed up quickly, um, you know, but the battery is a more consistent, you know, fuel source and it won't run out. You know, you're constantly recharging as you're burning it. And so, um, but if you're only ever burning gas, whenever you run out, you have to stop and fill up. And that's like carbohydrates. You know, if you're, if you're constantly all day, every day eating simple carbohydrates, every time your blood sugar drops, every time you run out, you're going to need, feel the need to stop and refill versus if you can train your body to burn your battery, which is your fat, your, your fuel source, then when you run out, your body naturally shifts into burning fat. And so you make that transition. It's, it's what we call a metabolic flexibility. You make that transition a lot easier. And so you don't feel as hungry. And so that would probably be my, my best kind of general recommendation. It's a good question. Uh, so if you, for Reardon, for, yeah. So if you look up Reardon Clinic on YouTube, we've got hundreds hundreds of videos. And so we have um, this whole class series, the whole food is medicine. This was the fourth class in the series. We have all the classes available online. We will next month be starting over back at the beginning. Um, the classes will not be live streamed or recorded anymore, but they will be available in person. So anybody who wants to come in person We'll be going back through the class series. So if you missed one over the next four months, we'll be going back through all of them. Um, or if it fits better in your schedule, you can pull it up online um, from when we recorded it previously. So, but there's a lot of great lectures, lectures dating back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, a lot of really great information. I had one other question from the internet. Uh, what about grapeseed oils? Where do they fit? Uh, in comparison to like the omega-3, omega-6? Grape seed, I believe, are higher in omega-6s. I'd have to look up what the percentage is, but I believe those fall more into the omega-6 category. And so any of your oils, though, the less processed you can get, the better. You know, so a cold-pressed omega-6 oil would still be better than a kind of a high-heat highly refined coconut oil, if that makes sense. And so, um, so I'd have to look up great seed or that's a good question. A lot of those, if you just, if you Google it, you can find the percentage, even in certain nuts and seeds and different foods, you can, you can find the percentage of omega threes to omega sixes. Like for instance, walnuts have higher omega threes versus sixes, whereas almonds have higher sixes versus threes, you know, both have both in them. And when you're eating a variety of foods, you know, a variety of whole foods, you'll naturally get a good balance between all of them. But I'd have to look up grapeseed oil. I'm not 100% sure on that one. Yes? Oh, the question is, what are the, our thoughts concerning bottled water? Um, so bottled, plastic water bottles, a lot of times are shipped um, hot. And so if you've ever tasted, you know, the water that comes from those bottles, um, it tastes a little plasticky. So those plastics, um, if you go back to the food additives class, the plastics um, are what are called endocrine disruptors. You know, so um, in men that can lower testosterone levels. You know, women it can it can affect it raise estrogen. They're they're estrogen mimickers. You know, so it can raise estrogen levels. So um, so really, I mean, the best way I I always use glass. You know, whenever possible, um, and you know try and just refill it. It's better for the environment too. But, um, but yeah, plastic water bottles are not an ideal, not an ideal way to get, to get water. So. I just have a comment. Yeah. So you do get quite a bit of 
Yeah, so the question was, you know, how much credence do we give to Dr. Gundry's stuff? And I, I think, I mean, his book is fantastic. Read the book just for, you know, the information. That's probably one of the best, you know, nutritional books I've read in a while in terms of new information. Um, not everybody needs to be strict lectin free, like he talks about. Not every. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, really he talks about, you know, he is in terms of beans. Um, he just says pressure cook your beans. So he doesn't say don't do beans, but pressure cook them. And this, this is where, you know, everything we talked about today is kind of the general lens that if you are doing whole foods, mm. you're doing real foods, mm. you know, start with that and then refine down from there. And, and kind of, and, and it, what, what a lot of people find is the more real foods they eat, the more they're sensitive to how certain foods affect them. You know, I, I'll use myself as an example. You know, when I went gluten-free six years ago, you know, naturally I started having more corn in my diet, more white potatoes because I was doing gluten-free products. And it wasn't until I did Dr. Gundry's three-day cleanse that I realized how much the the potatoes and the corn were triggering an inflammatory response. Now, I'm blood type AB. I'm real sensitive to lectin. So, you know, so everybody's a little bit different. And, and what you can get away with, I still do tomatoes. I still do some of that stuff, just not every day, just not in huge quantities. Um, and so that's where you can kind of start to refine what is right for you and what is right, you know, in your diet. And so I think he gives a good general guideline. And I think probably the most important lectins to avoid are in the grains that we eat, the high consumption of wheat and corn, you know, and, um, and then from there, refine down your vegetables. And so, uh-huh. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. And um, thank you, especially to those who have been here through the whole series. I've, I've, I've really, really enjoyed putting all this together. And I, I hope you have, too. Yeah. Yeah. I've got my lab here. Can you tell me what that would be because I have no sure. idea. I mean, he went through this so fast. Yeah. And um, so it's your ratio is right here. So you're 24.